Hello and welcome to Sinner to Winner podcast. This is episode nine and today I am so happy to be joined by my friend and work colleague, Rose Veldman. Some of you on Sinner to Winner may know Rose because I made a documentary about her. She's an amazing disabled athlete who specializes in golf. Um, for those that don't know Rose, she'd like to introduce herself. Rose, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, my name is Rose Veldman, and I am a disabled athlete, so you got that right. <laughs> um, and yeah, I also am an alumni and at Notre Dame, and I speak for the people who don't have voices, especially disabled people. I love that. And for those that don't know, um, that haven't watched the documentary yet, we're going to put a link in the description so you can watch that documentary. It's amazing. Uh, also, Rose, you didn't start off life in America, did you? You no. have an amazing story and I can't wait to get into it. Um, you started off actually in Haiti. I did. So you don't just speak English, do you? You actually speak another language. What's that? Yeah, it's called Haitian Creole. Would you like to say some words in Haitian Creole? Of course. Oh, hello, bonsoir, comment y est? Moi, rose, et moi, mais tout le monde. Yeah, that's amazing. Why don't actually for those that uh, family members that are still living in Haiti, why don't you say hello to them? Hello, moi, Sangelo. There you go, moi, Sangelo. <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's get into it. Rose, I wanted to talk to today because you have an amazing story. Um, Rose was uh, a Haiti survivor did the disaster. The disaster uh, took Rose's legs, unfortunately. Um, she survived saving, I believe you saved somebody's life. I did. Should we talk about that story? Of course. Yeah, tell us about that day, what you remember, if you don't mind sharing some of it with us and how um how it kind of changed the course of your life, right? Of course. So I I was jumping rope with my best friend in Haiti in 2010 when a huge 7.9 earthquake hit Haiti, which killed I think 200,000 people, I believe. And uh, thank God I wasn't one of those people who died. But um yeah, I was as I said, I was jumping rope with my best friend. And there was this little girl in our orphanage building because I'm adopted from an Haiti in an orphanage. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, there was this little girl in our orphanage building. Her name was Tila La. And she ended up being on the fourth story of our of the building because, you know, some buildings have stories and that's what she was in. She was on the fourth story out of a five-story building. And as I went... So I saw her needing help. Everybody else did not care. So I went and got her, threw her to her dad, and he told me to jump, and I couldn't because I got stuck, and the whole building came down with me. And But Tilala and his dad actually, you know, um, got away, and they were safe, but I was trapped under the earthquake, the building, for I think it was a day and a half to two days. So I was stuck under there. And when I finally got out, they took me to three different hospitals. All of them are full with injured people. And finally the fourth hospital got me because somebody died, I took his spot. And they told you know my family that the only way to save me and the orphanage people, the only way to save me is to amputate my legs. And in Haiti, there's no anesthesia. So I felt everything they did, cutting off my legs, but yeah. And then I got adapted right after it, afterwards, three months later, and now I'm here with you. Wow. That is a, and how old were you, Rose, when that happened? I was 10 years old. You were 10 years old. 10 years and old. So if anyone's having a bad day today, maybe they didn't get enough shots in their Starbucks or they forgot their latte or just, you know, let's get things into context. At 10 years old, this this lady, this little girl here, she had her legs amputated with no anesthesia mm -hmm. after being in an orphanage, raised in an orphanage. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like, Rose? Just like when we talk about, you know, some people, they'll, you know, they they get they grow up 
and you know they not they have a mum and dad or they don't have a mum and dad you have a unique story where you knew your mum but she couldn't look after you mm -hmm. and she had to ha get help that's right and she asked an orphanage to help with that that's right um did you how do you if you were talking to someone now who's mm -hmm. in an orphanage or somebody going through that what what kind of things does that what do you think? What's on your mind? What would you like to share or help somebody who's gone through that? What would you say? I would say that, first of all, you're not alone because there's a lot of people in orphanages or foster care system. But I would like to say you're not alone because there's many of us who's been out there, who's been through it, and that you're special and you will get adopted one day, even though if it's not today. And if you don't get adopted, you might as well you know, raise up, get, you know, when you grow up, you might be able to help somebody else who's in the adopted or foster care system. And, you know, and that's what I want to do when I'm older. I want to raise, I want to even have my own orphanage. I want to raise a million little kids and give them the best lives they ever had, like they've ever gotten. Well, Rose, you just to segue into something here, you're an amazing crocheter. I am. <laughs> Which crocheting's like knitting. She makes amazing hats and mm -hmm. all kinds of different things. I've got a really cool hat, a blue hat. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just thinking, we were talking today about the business and setting you up something like a tra charity. You donate some of the stuff. Maybe we could donate it to an orphanage. We could find some kind of orphanage or foster care system. Maybe we could make hats for the kids there. Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. Yeah, maybe God's talking through us God right now. God is talking through us. Yeah, that's that could be great. So you mentioned then after the Haiti disaster. So this is so strange. So from this tragic event, from this horrific situation, um, that actually, that was kind of a, um, a spark <laughs> that ignited your adoption right? Your, right your your parents who adopted you mm -hmm. they found out about what happened to you exactly and they wanted to help exactly um and at 10 11 years old you came to america america yeah. whereabouts in america did you come indiana indiana Warren whoop, whoop. State. <laughs> <laughs> but i love it that's my home notre dame let's go irish let's go irish so you come to indiana mm -hmm. you're 10 years old do you speak any english at this point oh absolutely nothing i the only two words i knew were hi and i love you that's it <laughs> oh my god you were like a little puppy i, I was i love you i, hi, hi. I love you i love you, I love you. <laughs> that's right and i would go up to strangers and like you know shake them and be like hi i love you <laughs> wow you yep. were you were definitely a fan's favorite when you went to indiana yes <laughs> and also your family were white as well yes my family is white so I, i'm i'm imagining in haiti at the time was there many white people around or? oh absolutely none no. i have never seen a white person in my life <laughs> so so all the there's all these white people that yep. look really different they're all talking really different mm -hmm. they've all got legs you've they've got no all got legs. you've got I no got legs no at this legs. point <laughs> wow I remember just coming to America the first time I got on that plane and landed in Chicago before I went to Indiana. I remember seeing all these white people. I've only seen like a few black people, like at least three black people in that whole entire airport. And I've seen a million seas of white. And I'm like, so then this lady who took me to Indiana so I could meet my adopted parents, I turned to her and I asked her, I'm like, why is there so many whites? I thought there was only black people. So that was a surprise for me. But I absolutely love my parents. I love my family. I would not trade them for the world, skin color or nothing. So yeah, you're not bound by your skin color. And and what an amazing thing to do as well for another family to help out. And and, and I think any family that adopts children, mm -hmm. you know, I am... I, um, I'm a parent and uh, I have one child that uh, I made, I didn't adopt. Mm -hmm. And, but I was thinking the other day, I was talking to somebody who I didn't know was adopt, mm -hmm. adopted. So I was talking and I said, I don't, I don't know. And this is God teaching yeah. me a lesson and I'll share it openly. I said to her, I don't know if I would adopt because 
you don't know what you're going to get. And we were having this conversation and she said to me, I was adopted. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. wow God yeah. just really showed me that. And I think she's amazing. I think she's an amazing person. So I was like, wow. And I think you're an amazing person. Well, thank you. you know, so it's like, yeah, I don't think it everybody's a child of God, right? And even exactly. even when you have your own children, I mean, my daughter will have so many different people in her from my lineage. Mm -hmm. And there's nature, there's nurture. So big shout out to your family who took that chance and they still give you so much love and still give you so much support, right? Exactly. It's amazing. I love them beyond anything. Yeah. Yeah, big shout out to the Veldmans. Lots of love from uh, the Sinner to Winner Studios today. So talking about that, do you have any like fond memories? So you're 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 11, 12, you've you know, you're in this new house with this family. What are some fond memories that you look back and it makes you feel nice and you feel like, you know, warm feelings inside? Oh my gosh, there's so many. I remember the first time I went to a restaurant. They took me out to a restaurant. And I did not know how restaurants work. So this lady, I already said, she came with me to America because she brought me to my parents because I couldn't fly by myself, obviously. I didn't have legs. I was 10. <laughs> so she brought me to America to meet my parents because my parents couldn't go and get me. But um, what ended up happening is so she explained to me how a restaurant works. So you order the food, you eat the food, and then you pay. So I was like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. So then I ordered my food, I ate the food, and then afterwards I was like, I don't have any money. <laughs> so, so they were like, um, that would have been a problem if you were paying. <laughs> but it wasn't. So I was really clever because I knew I wanted the food and I ate the food, but I didn't have any money. <laughs> wow. But of course my parents paid. <laughs> wow. That's great. Yeah, it's a whole new system, right? Exactly. I, all these things you don't even think of. We take that for granted. Like I, mm -hmm. I knew what restaurants were or, exactly. you know, cafes, we call them in England. Mm -hmm. um, and what about other things? Like, do you remember storybooks or oh my thinking. gosh yes my favorite movie when i first came actually the first movie i ever saw when i first came was sound of music and the lady was explaining everything to me i like sound of music <laughs> i love that movie anyway she was explaining all the words to me as i was watching it because i couldn't understand english but she was like explaining what was happening and i loved it and but I remembered my favorite Disney movie was Cinderella for a long time. So I remembered when I was little, I had no legs, obviously, but that was before I got my prosthetics. And I remember the little my sweeping and singing Cinderella, Cinderella. Anyways, um, so I so I imitated everything I saw. So I went out, no clothes on, by the way. <laughs> I was just in my little underwear. <laughs> I was a little girl, so I didn't have chest yet or anything else yet. So I went out and I was, you know, crawling on my little four-legged nubs in my arms. <laughs> and um, so I grabbed the broom and I was like sweeping outside the front porch and every car is like driving by looking. And the neighbors called my mom. They were like, um, you might want to come out and grab your kid before they call protect child protective services on you. <laughs> Because they thought, because people were like looking and they're like, Yeah, you were, <laughs> you were a character. They thought my mom was abusing me, even though I just saw the movie Cinderella and I was imitating the little mice sweeping. <laughs> <laughs> they thought that the family was putting you to work. Work, exactly. <laughs> Earning your keep. Earning my keep. <laughs> right? Um, That's amazing. So, Okay, so you, how long did it take you, do you think, before you started speaking English then? And Wow, actually, actually, it took me no time at all because I imitated everything everybody said. It took me at least three months to fully start speaking it because once you're little and, you're, and that's all you're surrounded by, you're picking up pretty easily because when I was little, there was nobody who spoke Haitian Creole because the lady that came with me who did speak Haitian Creole, she had to go back to her normal life. 
So, um, so I couldn't understand English and my parents couldn't understand Haitian Creole. So what ended up happening is they would get books for me to read. They would, they even had a slow translation diary Haitian, from Haitian Creole to like English and English to Haitian Creole. So if I needed something, I would point to it or I would try to say it. And it was so cute. But I remember it took me three months to fully understand it. Wow. Yeah. So you're the kind of person when you put your mind to it, mm -hmm. you can achieve things. Oh my gosh, yes. And you need to remember that, right? I do. <laughs> when you put your mind to it, you can achieve it. You can achieve anything. Yeah. And that just shows like, you know, like you are a survivor. Some people say I'm a survivor, but you literally are a survivor. <laughs> and, you know, you can get after it. And when you put your mind to things, you can achieve it. And that's what I'm going to tell people who are watching today. Look, if, if, if you think that you can't achieve things or that you're struggling in life. Like, listen to Rosie's story. Look what she's come through. And everybody struggles, and we're always going to struggle. That's just part of life. But take take notice of what you can do and what you can get through. So let, talking about struggles and things that are, are difficult, you probably, uh, you know, you start high school or you start school, all these kids, you don't, it's a different culture. You've oh got... You know, they've got legs. You've got no legs. They've no got legs. white skin. You you probably did meet skin. some. Did you in Indiana or no? Well, not Any many. People not color? many. <laughs> yeah. um, I only knew two people. I went to an all white high school that had at least, I think I was the third black kid. The only, there was like three black kids. And how was that, Rose? How was that? You know, like, how did you, how did you feel? How did you deal with it? With, what was some because everybody goes to school, everybody struggles, everybody gets bullied. Look, we know this, yeah. that's part of life. You know, it's an unfortunate thing that happens. Yeah. Um, what helped you when you were going through tough times? Do you remember anything that helped? Any any activities you did, or did you have anyone to talk to? Or what would you tell a kid who might go through some difficulties like that? Well, actually, I've been well, to be honest, I've never gotten bullied. My parents made sure I had tough skin, thick skin, not in like, you know, insulting me or anything to build my skin up. No, they never did that. But they made sure that I felt like I fit in, you know, like if I said I couldn't do something, my dad would look at me and was like, you can do it. You can do anything you put your mind to, like you said. And I was like, no, I can't do it. And I would be crying. And he was like, no, you can do it. You will do it. And you can do it. And he would not help me. So I had to figure out how to do it. So he did help me in like things I physically could not do. But if anything that I found challenging, he would make sure that I could not do it in order to help me do it. But yeah. Um, but to a kid that's struggling, especially with being bullied, because... I kind of went through something like that, but not the harsh way of bullying. But I would say just these people who are bullying you, they're going through their own things. And if you think about it, if they're going through things and they're taking it out on you, either tell somebody, get a therapist, or, you know, just ignore them because they're going through things themselves. And I think telling a therapist or the teachers or a school counselor is the best way to do it because bullies do need to learn that it's not okay. I know they're going through things, but it's not okay to take it out on others. Wow, that's a that's a really great answer. Definitely speak up and and yeah, when things are not right, tell somebody. Exactly. For sure. I love that, Rose. I love that strength, hope, and experience you bring in right, mm -hmm. right here on Sinner to Winner. <laughs> because we're all sinners and we all want to be winners. And like our favorite saint, Saint Augustine. That's right, Saint uh, Augustine. If Saint, if Saint, if Saint, if Saint Augustine, Augustine can be a saint, you know. So can we? <laughs> there's, a there's a chance for me and you, isn't there's there? There we are. There we are. There's a chance. So you know, um, we're all trying to get a little bit better. You know, we've all made mistakes. Just like those bullies, they're going through stuff. We don't know what's going on in their house or That's what true. they're going through. It's that it's like that line, hurt people, hurt people. Mm. You heard that one? I have. Hurt people, hurt people. So it's tough, but at the same time, if we can remember that, mm, yeah, maybe they're hurting and that's why that's they're right. doing what they're doing. A little bit of compassion, a little bit of empathy we can have for others that go through stuff and mm -hmm. hurt themselves, hurt others. We can perhaps, if we can, and be patient, we can understand why. So, okay, well, let's fast forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned your dad and how he 
you know, believes in you and wants you to believe in yourself. I believe it was your dad who got you into golf. That's right. <laughs> so, so tell me about this. Thanks, dad. Um, My dad, my adopted dad, Thomas, he's an amazing person. He always believed in me. He said, he always tells me every day, you're my girl, Rose. And I'm like, you're my dad, dad. <laughs> Anyways, he would be like, He's like, you can do anything you put in your mind to, even if it seems bleak and if it seems hopeless, you got this. So I always believed that because I went through life believing I could do anything. And that's why I'm not, you know, shying away from showing who I am and my true self, because my dad built me up and I now I can help build other people up. So your dad is he's building you up and he takes you to the driving range because he loves golf. Yeah. <laughs> and do you remember your first, the first time you hit a ball or do you remember like what why you <laughs> fell in love with it? Oh my gosh, I fell in love with well the first time I hit a ball was I think I was 12 or 11. My dad took me to a driving range. We were trying to find sports I could play. I tried basketball. That did not work. <laughs> I'm the slowest one. And on top of that, I can't really move to defend, you know, people. So then I tried, you know, tennis. Can't move side to side or run. <laughs> so that's not part of it. So then he remembered he liked golf. So he always thought golf would be challenging for me because it's a lot of standing. So he was like, hmm. So he was like, let's try it. So one day he took me out to the driving range with him. And he was like, he was like, do you want to hit a ball? So me being so tiny, I had, he had went to the clubhouse and he got this tiny, like a four-year-old glove, like somebody who would be four <laughs> to hit it. But I was so small that, you know, because I came weighing 35 pounds. Okay. That was very very small <laughs> so I was 10 35 pounds anyway so he got me a four-year-old club so I grabbed the club and I whammed it <laughs> and my dad was like whoa he was like that's your sport that's your sport wow so I hit it even past his and he was like you're 10 years old and you can hit the ball that far so that's your sport Wow. And that was it. And you were hooked ever since. It. And I know. You, and I was hooked. <laughs> you love golfing. I love golf. Every day I go out, I'm always like, let's go play golf. I even tell you, let's go play golf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. And uh, it gets you out and about and you play now in tournaments mm -hmm. and it's amazing. And uh, you have other friends in the community. You built exactly. a community doing mm -hmm. it. People know you. Um and it, it inspires you, right? It inspires exactly. you to achieve and keep right. going. And when you feel down, you play golf. That's and right. It gets you back up. Mm -hmm. So um, you also like crocheting. I, when did crocheting <laughs> start? When did you start getting into knitting? That's such an odd, <laughs> odd thing. Like, Well, to be honest, I learned how to knit. And I think it was fifth or sixth grade. I remember there was an art class and we could either learn knitting or drawing. And I was sick of drawing. So then I was like, let me go to knitting. So I went and I tried knitting and I fell in love with it. So I did that for like two years and then I stopped. And then once I went to a treatment center for mental health, which we're going to get to later, um, for mental health, um, then they had a knitting class and I just relearned how to do it again. And then I got sick of knitting. So then there was like this different form of knitting called crocheting. So then I started falling in love with it because it's a lot easier and it's more forgiving. So if you want something that's forgiving and, you know, still comes out to cool patterns and... And it's quite like, anything. I've noticed it's kind of calming for it's you. Very it's, calming. it's like meditative in a way. Meditative. It focuses you, it relaxes mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And if people want to know more about Rosie's artistic side, we did a documentary on that. Too. That's right. So that will be in the link. That's a really cool documentary as well. Two documentaries. I forgot about that one. That's mm -hmm. an amazing one, right? Yeah, a golf one and an artistic one. Yeah. So so that's amazing. You you did that. So what's for me, I'm English, so we don't have grades. What's fifth, sixth grade in uh, fifth, sixth grade? It's like old? going and so it's usually when you're like ten years old. Fourth, I mean nine to ten, you're usually in third or fourth. 
fourth grade, right. meaning in classes. That's and then you go to fifth grade, sixth grade, so like seventh, 11, 12, eighth, thirteen, yeah, 14. fourteen, fifteen, and then you get into high school and then college and then after high school. I mean, after high school, then you stop counting college. Then you're like, oh, I'm in my first year of college, second year of college. Oh, I'm a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. So yeah. Hey, Rose, I just want to say as well during this uh, chat that we're having, you're doing really well. Oh, and, thank um, you. It's amazing, like, hearing you speak and talk about these things that are not easy to talk about. We're talking about stuff that, you know, um, carries a bit of weight, you know, on our exactly. shoulders, these moments, these emotions, these events. And they took a toll. I'll kind of narrate this little next bit. Mm -hmm. They took a toll on you to the point where you realized it was affecting your mental health. Exactly. And your mum and dad and your family that love you very much um, tried to, well, they... Uh, to get me help. Yeah, they yeah. got facilitators, practitioners, uh, mm -hmm. communities that could get involved and help you because, you know, there was, you had stuff inside that you know what obviously was um affecting your mm -hmm. relationships exactly um with people and um your development as a person and that's that's an ongoing thing right that's true. for all of us just at different levels you know i've got my mm -hmm. stuff and everyone anyone watching this if they're a human being they have their stuff that's right we all have our stuff mm -hmm. just at different levels mm -hmm. um how how has that been for you, like the journey and this mental health and realizing that, you know, um, there's nature, there's nurture, the way you deal with process things is different to other people. How how does that make you feel? How are you feeling about that? You know, if there's anyone that's maybe in your situation and you know people that um, have similar situations or are involved in our community, how do you think, what could you share that might help them? Well, I know that there's a there's a rainbow at the end of the storm. That's all I know. Thank you to my higher power, which is God. Thank you, God. Um, that you can get through anything. And if it's not God, it's some um, it's yourself or it's something a force or something higher than you are. Or the ocean. Um, That's an amazing answer because it tells it says that in 12 step. I talk about 12 step on this channel a lot. And it, in every 12-step program, mm -hmm. after step one, which is admitting you're powerless over food, admitting you're powerless over gambling, admitting you're powerless over alcohol, admitting you're powerless over meth, admitting you're powerless over sex relations, admitting you're powerless over spending, whatever okay. it is, the second step mm -hmm. is about God, That's is right. about finding a higher power. That's right. And it goes from there. Mm -hmm. And I have to say... Big thank you to Rose, <laughs> who takes me most Sundays to church. That's right. Um, you know, I'm a seeker and Rose is an amazing Catholic girl. <laughs> she knows everything about Catholicism. That's and right. she teaches me. And when she's not there, I do I do cheat sometimes and and takes the communion take the without communion. being Sometimes baptized I'm a, or confirmed. I am, I am baptized, but oh. I've not been confirmed because I'm I'm church. Or have your first communion. Yeah, the first communion. I've been, I've, and I haven't done my confession. No, we haven't done that either. But sometimes I get really hungry and then it was... Oh, God. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> but there was this one time, what was it? It was... Um, Oh, what was the what was it? I came I, I came back and I said I'm sorry. It was a special occasion. It was like oh my god, it was Easter Sunday. It was Easter Sunday, and I I I ate the body of Christ because I felt like He would want me to do that. It was Easter Sunday, and we were in great spirits. But um, I've got to thank you, Rose, because we do have a chuckle and we have a laugh. And the good thing about the Bible and the stories and everything, it's like people struggled you think of mary magdalene and she was a sex worker and exactly. you think you think about these people who have murdered and all this kind of all these stories that are in there and they turn their lives around and it, and, and again it just shows like it's i like bernard hopkins is one of my favorite boxers and mm -hmm. he was uh incarcerated he spent four or five years i think in prison before his first boxing match went on to become a world champion mm -hmm. and he's got a saying and it's probably not his but he says it mm -hmm. it's never too late to do something great that's right and i think we have to remember that like it's um 
it's an amazing thing this life and mm -hmm. i love that about catholicism and also about 12 step with the fourth step and the fifth step we can purge we mm -hmm. can be forgiven we can do things look we make mistakes it's exactly. part of, it's part of being human right oh we're human 100 percent. and mistakes is what makes us who we are right that's how we learn yeah that's what makes us different from dogs different from cats like yeah, sure, dogs might be like, oh, I made a mistake and be like, I peed on the floor. But we have to fix it. But we have to fix in it. In this house. Yeah, but, you know, us. It's, it's cat pee. It's not dog in this it's, house. It's, exactly. cat, it's cat pee. I have a kitten. <laughs> anyway, but it's different if a human make a mistake and be like, oh, my gosh. But we learn from our mistakes, and that's what makes us special. Yeah, and it's uh, it's we're always evolving, right? We're exactly. Always, we're always learning. What's... um. What's something that you've learned recently, Rose? What's something that comes to mind when you think in recent times as as a young lady growing up? You're twenty. You're in your twenty-four. Twenty-four. Mm -hmm. Something that you've learned in recent years about yourself and about your your own recovery and journey and twelve step and journey and in life. What do you What do you What comes to mind right now that one of, one of your biggest lessons in in your short window of life that you've had? So My short window of life. That's true. Yeah. Um... You're a baby. Oh, thank you. Um, in my short window of life, I've learned. You like that saying? I love it. I love it. Um, I've learned that, like you said, it's never too late to do something great. Because I, let's just say, I wasn't the easiest kid to deal with, especially for my parents. But as I tried each day, I would try harder each day because I knew I had to make a. Make my life more meaningful so they can feel accomplished and I can feel accomplished. You know, they can feel like, oh, Rose is set up for success. She can do things on her own. And, you know, and I can be like, oh, I'm happy. And this is truly what I want to do. And this is why golf is a great thing for me, because through golf, I learned that it doesn't just build community. It builds friendship. It builds like character. It it helps it helps with like all my mental health problems yeah sure it causes sometimes more mental health problems because i'm like frustrated and i'm like breaking clubs i'm like <laughs> but but tiger woods does that I mean, does it. he's one of the great he's the greatest player ever and he gets upset sometimes. exactly so yeah it's all part it is like a little microcosm of life and it teaches us patience and mm -hmm. it teaches that sometimes no matter what you do things will go wrong the wind's gonna blow and that's or... right you know, like you lose that ball that you thought was a great was shot. A great shot. <laughs> or, the one, or the one that's a bad shot gets a nice ricochet and turns into a great <laughs> shot. It's kind of like life. Sometimes we don't know. It's like, maybe this is a bad thing. Maybe this is a good thing. It kind of takes us back to the top. Like, it's it's a horrendous thing that happened to you. But without that, would you be sat here today? Would oh, you, heck no. Would you be in America? Would you would not be in America. Well, I probably would have met my mom and dad because I did meet them in 2009, four months before the Haiti earthquake. So the Haiti earthquake happened in January 2010, and they came in October 2009. Yeah, all these things. All so these... I did meet them. Yeah. But well, without that, that they wouldn't have had the relationship, relationship with me to then think no we got to help this person that we exactly. met exactly that's such an unfortunate thing and we've got it we can do something about it and we're going to do something about it's it it's true yeah life is complicated but i love how it rolls right you gotta love life yeah we're having if you an don't love life then what's the meaning it's that's it it's a, it's um it's an adventure it's it's look it's full of light. It's full of darkness. It's got all the colors. You know, if you live long enough, you're going to go through some stuff and you're going to have highs. You're going to have lows. It's a bit like a round of golf. Yes. <laughs> like one of my you're gonna have birdies you're gonna have bogeys exactly you're gonna have a triple bogey a few maybe. boring parts and maybe a par maybe a hole in one who knows who knows yeah wow so i think we're coming to the end of our conversation today rose we've had an amazing conversation and it's been great i'm i'm looking forward to people seeing this and then getting new viewers to look at the documentaries we made of course um is there anything that's coming to your mind that you'd just like to say before we uh, call it a day on episode nine? Is there anything that you feel like you wanted to share or talk about? Of course. Well, if you want to pick up something new, 
go for it. Don't let anybody stop you because let's just say you're one of a kind. And with that, we come to an end. Wow. Well, thank you very much for coming on Sinner to Winner today, Rose. Really appreciate it. No and love you. Deuce. <laughs>